two scripture lessons for today, both from the text that we share with our Jewish brothers and sisters and both the sign text for this Sunday morning. The first comes from the Psalms, it's Psalm number 82. And unlike perhaps many of the Psalms we might remember, it is not a Psalm of comfort like the 23rd Psalm, nor is it a Psalm that is a praise of creation like Psalm 104, nor is it even a song or a Psalm that would be used in worship as people were coming into the sanctuary, like a number of the other Psalms in that wonderful book of 150 songs. Instead, it is an ethical psalm. It portrays God talking to a whole group of mini-gods, a common image of, his, of the psalmist's time and place in the ancient Near East, and reminding both all of those mini-gods, but also all the rulers of the world, what it is God really wants. We don't normally think of psalms as being ethical wisdom literature, but this one is. The second reading comes from a few hundred years later than Psalm 82. It comes from the words of the prophet Amos, who had been a farmer, a dresser of sycamore trees, who lived in a time when Israel had gone far astray from being in right relationship, not only with God, but also with one another and with the world around them. God raised up Amos to get them back on the right track. And these two little verses from chapter seven of the prophet Amos share with us Amos's vision of how God did that. So let our hearts and our lives be open to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the words of the ancient psalmist and the prophet. In the divine council, God has taken God's place. God holds judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan, maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding, they walk around in shadows. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any noble. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. A reading from the Hebrew prophets. Now this is what God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of God's powerful word. Please join me in a time of prayer. Let us pray. You have heard the songs we've offered this morning. Songs singing your praise, your glory, your wonder and songs imploring your peace and your justice in our lives and in this world. As we consider and go deeper into the words of the ancient psalmist and prophet, we pray that you would open us, O Lord. Open us in mind, in heart, in soul, and let those ancient words go deep, deep enough to become new life, deep enough to become new life in our lives and through our lives to offer new life to this world. We pray in your name, amen. Amen. 
the eagle has landed. <laughs> Maybe you've heard that expression a few times in the last few days, especially last night, when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the landing of the lunar module on the surface of the moon. First time that a crewed, meaning a human-powered, a human-inhabited lunar module had actually set down on the moon. The eagle has landed. I don't know where you were, or if you were even born at the time that happened, but I was, I don't know, I don't know exactly how old I was, but I remember we were at my house, my mom's house in Tempe, Arizona. It was hotter than Hades outside because it was July in the, middle of, in, in the middle of the Sonora Desert. We had a black and white TV, and not only my family, but my sister's fiance family were all gathered because she was getting married, they were getting married in about six weeks at the end of the summer. My sister's fiance really wanted the two of them to hang out together. My sister, being the quintessential scientist that she is, was glued to the TV. I could have told them right then and there, <laughs> it may not last. <laughs> On that sketchy black and white TV, seeing, the, seeing Neil Armstrong exit that lunar module, but before that, when they had finally touched down and Michael Collins could see that lunar module on the surface of the moon, and Armstrong proclaimed for all the world to hear, the eagle has landed. And you know, it almost didn't. It almost crashed. It almost landed in a blaze of fire. Because from the very moment that that lunar module had separated off the command module, those astronauts were in trouble. Because of something of a variety of factors, one of them called lumpy gravity. <laughs> Apparently the surface of the, or the moon has a different kind of gravity or different kind of gravity than, than the Earth does. Because on the Earth, gravity is pretty consistent. On the moon, it's lumpy. Now, I know about lumpy gravity in other kinds of ways, but I didn't know, about it, didn't know that that was going to cause problems for the, for the Apollo astronauts. But that lumpy gravity meant that the, that the lunar module got pulled away from that command module faster than anybody had predicted. And so it meant that as, our, as they were do, relying on the instruments down in Houston to guide them to where they thought they had a safe plane to land, instead they overshot the mark by about three or four miles. And in addition to that, the alarms were going off in the lunar module because the computers were getting overloaded. And so here you are, Neil Armstrong looking down, watching that plane below you that you're supposed to lie on, uh, you're supposed to land on, uh, go off into the distance, and hearing the alarms go off, and you're seeing this huge crater where you're about to land that is filled with boulders. And Houston doesn't have a clue as to how to help you out of this thing. And you're also running low on fuel. You have about two minutes left of fuel in order to slow down enough to be able to do a soft landing. And then finally, so Armstrong took over manually landing that craft, but as he got closer and closer to the lunar surface, it was, the craft was, look, was operating like a helicopter in so far as stirring up all that lunar moon dust. He could barely see the way ahead. But what he did see were some rocks up through the dust at the end of, that pl of a new plane that he thought he could land on. And by staying focused on those rocks, he was able to judge how fast he was going and also stay on course to be able to land. The eagle has landed, thank God. I saw the Lord, said the prophet Amos. I saw the Lord standing by a wall that had been made straight with a plumb line. And in the Lord's hand was another plumb line. And the Lord said to me, go to my people Israel and tell them this is the plumb line for their lives. 
This is how they are going to get back on track. How they are going to live in this tumultuous and oppressive and unfaithful time they're in. A plumb line. And in that time of Amos, the people of Israel needed that plumb line as much as Neil Armstrong needed to be able to focus on those rocks. Because they were having to navigate through all kinds of things, all kinds of ways that they had gone off the right path. Not because of sexual immorality, but because they weren't doing what God had asked them to do. Which, as Dean Harry Atridge reminded us last week, you can recite the whole Torah, the whole scope of all Jewish law standing on one leg, all the way from Genesis all the way up through Exodus. Why? Because you can say, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> and that's the plumb line. That's the plumb line. And we need that plumb line more than we ever have before. Because we have a lot of people in this culture and around this world claiming what it means to be Christian. And that is not the plumb line they're using. But Amos says to the people of Israel, here is the plumb line. And when he says that, he is referring back to all of those teachings. All of those teaching in the Leviticus Code, which was not so much about sexual immorality as it was about how do you treat the poor? How do you pay your workers a living wage? How do you care for the widows and the orphans, meaning the most vulnerable women and the most vulnerable children in your time? That is the plumb line for how it is we stay in right relationship with this God. That's the plumb line. And unless we start saying that's the plumb line of the Christian faith, others will tell us and tell this world a very different understanding. It's the same understanding that echoes to us through that Psalm 82, which is not a psalm of comfort. I love the 23rd Psalm. It is not a psalm of the glory of all creation. I love the fact that in Psalm 104, the psalmist talks about God creating all the heavens and the earth and badger, rock badgers to live in the rocks that God created and whales upon the sea because God just had a good sense of humor to create whales. I love those psalms, but this psalm nails us. This psalm says... Folks, this is what it's about. This is your plumb line. Caring for those who are the most vulnerable, the weak, the orphan, the destitute. You want to be in right relationship with God, the psalmist says, this is what you have to do. That's your plumb line. And that, my brothers and sisters, I think is the only way we're going to navigate through this time that we're in right now. To take that Bible that is at the very heart of our faith and to make it the plumb line for our lives. Does it have a lot of bad stuff in it? Sure it does, because it was written by, by people in a certain time and place. But it also continually, continually overrides its own racism, its own anti-Semitism, its own anti-womanism with a different word, a word that you find in Psalm 82. That this God in whom we believe is the one who cares for this whole world. A word that we find in the prophet Micah who says that the only thing God requires of us is to love mercy, do justice, and walk humbly with God. A word that we find in the Leviticus Code that says, do not oppress the stranger and the alien among you because you were once strangers and aliens yourselves. You were once immigrants yourselves. That's the plumb line. And unless we start saying, this is what this faith is about. This is what this Bible is about. Then others are going to say to this world what this faith and this Bible are all about. And it's not just the job of the preachers. It is the job of all of us. <laughs> you happen to be Protestants, my friend. <laughs> and one of the gifts of the Protestant Reformation 
was that Luther saw that the word had to be central and that the word was translated from Latin which only the, the wealthy, elite, educated people could read, the priests, and got it in German into the hands of the people. And you've got it in your hands in whatever language you speak as well. And therefore, it's not just for our own personal edification. It is to be wrestled with and engaged with and to find that plumb line through the shadows, through the tumult, through all the ways of death that are around us and find God's way of life. That's what our faith demands of us. And if we don't do and commit ourselves to that kind of engagement with this script, with these sacred scriptures, then we let other people interpret it for us. And that has consequences. A good example, the story of Mary of Magdala. Down through the ages, because of the way that story was interpreted and mushed up with a bunch of other stories in the gospel, the common knowledge, quote unquote, was that Mary of Magdala was a reformed, was a prostitute who'd been saved and reformed by Jesus. Balderdash. <laughs> there is no biblical evidence for that claim. What the Bible shows us, and you can come on Wednesday night and find out more, but what the Bible shows us is that Mary Magdala was a, was a leader of other women who provided for Jesus and his disciples out of their means. He depended upon her and the others. Moreover, what the Bible also says in all four Gospels that Mary Magdala was the first person at the tomb and found it empty. And in John's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel, she's the one who proclaims the resurrection. She is the apostle to the apostles. Now, how in God's name we went from those biblical texts that says that Mary Magdalene is this woman of leadership and power to being a reformed prostitute, come on Wednesday and find out. But it has consequences. It has consequences. It has consequences because it puts, it puts women in a certain role and it puts men in a certain role, neither of which are very healthy. It says that women are perennial seductresses who have to be redeemed by a male savior. That is not what this, script, what this story tells us. But if you take it to its illogical conclusion, you have the example of a leader of this nation saying that he will not have lunch or meet with a woman who is not his wife on his own without a third person being there. Why? Because men are weak, balderdash, and women are seductress, temptresses, prostitutes, also balderdash. And that's not what this text says. That's not what's in this Bible. And unless you and I take the time to make this sacred text the plumb line of our lives, to teach it to our children and grandchildren, to speak up when somebody starts saying ridiculous things about the Christian faith on either side of the argument, then you're letting other people interpret for you. And we are going to continue to be as lost as we are now, if not more so in this land. This Bible comes down unequivocally on the side of welcoming the stranger and the alien. This Bible comes down unequivocally on justice for the poor and for the oppressed. This Bible comes down unequivocally on the side of seeing women and men in partnership together as disciples of Christ. This Bible comes down unequivocally that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And how we treat this earth has consequences. It comes down as a plumb line for all the issues that we face in this nation and in this world this day. This Bible tells us the story of Jesus Christ who consistently reached across lines of color, class, race, creed, all those things. This Bible contains the story of Jesus healing the daughter of a rabbi and healing the servant of a Roman centurion and healing the daughter of a Syrophoenician, meaning immigrant, refugee, mixed race, woman of color. That's what this Bible says. 
And I don't know about you, but that's the plumb line I want for my life. And that's the plumb line I believe this world needs now. And I challenge you. I know it's hot. <laughs> I know it's the middle of July. I know it'd be easy just to turn the whole thing off. But you and I have a responsibility to this world and to generations yet to come to find our way through this wilderness and to bring others along as well. This faith is a faith that will get us out of this and lead us through the shadows, steer us around those big boulders, guide us through all the dust storms of our lives, and get us back on track. I saw the Lord with a plumb line, a plumb line for Israel, and a plumb line, my brothers and sisters, for you and for me and for this church. A plumb line of justice, of mercy, of love that knows no bounds and knows no end. Of love that will overcome all of our divisions, that overcomes our fear, and overcomes all of our ways of death, hatred, and fear in this world. Pick up the plumb line of love. Thanks be to God.